Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today, especially over your lunch hour. Um, as all of you know, the legislative session does adjourn today. Um, it'll be midnight tonight. So we just thought we would just go ahead and provide everyone all the information that we currently have about what's been going on. It's been a busy few months, um, but thank you so much for joining us. You know, the, the public policy work that CICASA does uh, is so important for our state, and really it is such a team effort. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, let me see. We're going to go ahead and jump in. Okay, so I wanted to start with uh, just giving a little bit of background about CCASA's policy work. So one thing that always really strikes me is, you know, this organization is 31 years, 31 years old and has such a rich history of doing legislative work. So, you know, we think about the 80s and those images on the right, but during that time, CCASA was so busy uh, really creating a statutory framework that supports survivors and, and holds uh, offenders accountable. So, um, so I just put, posted some of our legislative successes over the past three decades. Um, and what's really exciting is just knowing that that work is continuing. Um, so we're going to jump right into the 2015 legislative session. Um, one thing that you know I wanted to talk about first is how people can get involved. So I just wanted to go ahead and give a little bit of a plug for the CCASA Public Policy Committee. You know, I know that all of you are so busy and have you know a ton of obligations and things on your plate. Um, but I, I do hope that folks think about um, lending some time and volunteering to be be a part of our Public Policy Committee. I think in the past, folks have been sort of intimidated by the work and have thought, oh, you know, I've never. Um, worked on these issues before, um, you know, can I really, do I really have something to contribute to the policy team? And the answer is absolutely yes, you do. Um, the, the public policy work is really comprised of folks who do this work um, on the ground and can share some perspectives about how, um, how the legislation that's passing really is going to affect um, you know, affect what's going on in the community. So think about doing that. Um, we also, you know, encourage folks. Um, what's great is if we can have like one representative from different agencies around the state. So, you know, and even working with, we have some agencies in Colorado that they have like a different point person kind of circulates and goes to the meetings to make sure that the information is made available. Um, so that is something for you to consider as well. All right, so let's just jump in and talk about 2015. Um, I wanted to give folks this website, um, ledge.state.co.us. That is really your website for everything related to the Colorado Legislative Session. Um, I don't have time to go into a ton of details today about every single bill, um, but this is the website you can go to where you can read uh, full bills. You can look at the history. Uh, it can really give you sort of all the information you need to know, who sponsored the legislation, um, all of those details. You know, I did just want to mention there's some kind of tricks when reading legislation and reading bills, and you can always give me a call or email me if you have any questions. Um, but when you're when you're looking at legislation, there's there's lots of different versions. You know, it's the, the version is it was introduced um, and then legislation changes. So you may be looking at an engrossed version or a re engrossed version um, as the bill moves through the legislative process. So when you're reading legislation, um, and a lot of folks know this, but I just wanted to mention that you know language that's lowercase that's existing law when you see language in a bill that's all caps that's proposed changes under this bill and then if there's text that's shaded or text that's underlined those are amendments that have been added so it's kind of good just to have a heads up about those things when you are reading bills and again um, you can ask me any questions but since we are doing just sort of an overview today i wanted to make sure that folks had this website so they could look at some um, some of these efforts in more detail so we're just going to jump right in i'm going to start with with Senate bills and then go through House bills. And this, again, isn't an all-encompassing list of legislation that CCASA was monitoring or involved with this session, uh, but I wanted to be sure to give some of the highlights. So I'm just going to jump right in with Senate Bill 20. Um, so as folks may know, we had a ton of postings and emails and social media about this bill. So I don't want to repeat myself too much with what you already know, but our sort of tagline for Senate Bill 20 is Colorado's version of Aaron's Law. Um, so on the right is a picture of a survivor named Aaron Marin. She's based in Illinois, but has worked on legislation nationally, um, working to make states 
uh, better places for children that are victims of child sex abuse. And, and the way that she's tackled this issue is through school-based education and training. Um, so she talks a lot about, you know, in, in her um, life, there were numerous sort of warning signs that she was being victimized, um, but none of her teachers saw the warning signs and she didn't know how to disclose uh, to a school professional and then just feeling like, you know, if she had have um, disclosed that her school staff when she was a kid wouldn't have known how to respond. So when this legislation has passed in 20 other states, it frankly has been a much more robust version of what we see, what we have in Colorado or what Senate Bill 20 um, seeks to accomplish in Colorado. Uh, but it's, it's really important for folks doing this work just to get a sense of sort of the lay of the land and what's politically achievable. And while Aaron's law um, in some states goes very far in a direction we would love to see where states are, uh, there's mandated training for all teachers, mandated training for K through 12 staff and school administrators around child sex abuse prevention and intervention, and then mandated um, some curricula for kids so that they understand personal body safety. That wasn't politically feasible to do in Colorado, at least um, not this year and frankly anytime soon um but we worked with senator newell who's just it was an amazing bill sponsor on this i uh, figuring out okay maybe we can't do what um, other states have done but what can we do in our state what do we think is politically viable for this year i um, mean that's where senate bill 20 came in so senate bill 20 does three main things it um it creates a position within the colorado school safety resource center which is um, a government entity that's housed within the department of public safety so within that um, agency, there will be a new staff member who is hired, who is um, it will be essentially a child sexual abuse technical assistance specialist. And this person's job will be to provide curricular recommendations and training um, throughout the state for schools. So this person will sort of be an, an additional resource for schools specifically on the topic of child sexual abuse. The bill also encourages schools to adopt a child sexual abuse prevention plan. As you'll see, that that word encourage, you know, it's, it's not a mandate, but I still think it's powerful to have that in statute because I think parents and PTAs can, can look at that and say, you know, the legislature encouraged our schools to have a child sexual abuse prevention plan. You know, what does that look like for our school? What can we do to get that going in our school? Um, and then the third piece of the bill is, you know, as folks know, teachers have to obtain continuing education credits to stay licensed as a teacher. So the bill specifically states that education around prevention and intervention of child sexual abuse is a content area in which teachers are eligible for their um, continuing education credits. So, you know, we, we just saw Senate Bill 20 as a great first step to really increase conversations and resources around child sex abuse, specifically uh, within our schools. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, we knew a wide sweeping mandate wasn't politically viable, but we thought this would be a great starting place. So it was a little bit to our dismay to find out that the bill, uh, we were being told very early on that it was going to die, that it didn't have any chance in passing. Um, you know, it just had a huge battle that, that it most likely wasn't going to win. Uh, but we felt like this issue was really important. And if we couldn't even take these first steps around child sex abuse and school-based prevention and intervention, then, you know, wow, we're in trouble. Um, so our CCASA, um, as well as many other allied organizations, including uh, the Wings Foundation, embarks on what I think was a pretty massive social media and advocacy campaign. Um, so if, if you follow us on Facebook or Twitter, I think you saw a lot of memes and posts about passing Senate Bill 20. Um, we also worked pretty closely with some media outlets that uh, that sort of took an approach to this bill that was favorable to our position. So um, Fox 31, for example, did some great coverage. Uh, so we had some some really great media partners on this effort as well and that was really helpful really what made this bill go forward was all of the constituent activism and advocacy um like i said this bill just had such an uphill battle and it was incredibly inspiring to see the outcome so the pictures on your screen you know these are folks who testified in support of it um I know that just in mass numbers, people contacted their legislators, and I know we can all get a little cynical, just like, you know, it doesn't matter. Do they really pay attention? And and I'll tell you, you know, Senate Bill 20 absolutely is, the pr is proof that they do pay attention because it became so obvious that 
constituents really were watching this one and constituents were going to be extremely unhappy um, and it would really make our elected officials look very bad <laughs> to not support efforts around child sex abuse prevention um, that that even though folks didn't want to create a new job position they didn't maybe thought this wasn't the role of the school um, ultimately this bill this deal, bill did pass so um, I, I think it's a huge success story but the success really came from folks who took the time to um, take some talking points um, and craft them in an email and contact their legislators it made a huge difference and this will this bill will be signed into law so thank you to everyone um, who took action on that one and um, the next one i want to talk about is senate bill 30 and this was a human trafficking bill um there's a lot of interest i will say at the legislature on human trafficking issues uh, i think that you know the media uh, focuses on this issue a lot and and it's an extremely important issue sometimes it's it's kind of fascinating though for folks who've done sex assault and domestic violence work for a long time to see how much energy and attention and, and frankly spending can go towards human trafficking that we may not see towards other issues that are really we think really connected to human trafficking um so there were several human traffic there's there's always a handful of human trafficking bills that move forward senate bill 30 is uh, the one that CASA was the most involved with um senator morgan carroll brought this forward she is the former uh, majority leader with the democrats um now she is the minority leader since the republicans um, do have a majority in the the senate um that she reached out to our office and asked us, you know, sort of to weigh in on this one and support it if we felt that that we could. Um, so CICASA did actively support this effort. It does a few things. We have a ton of bills to talk about, so I don't want to get completely bogged down in the deep in the details. But essentially, if an individual is being charged with prostitution, uh, then they can assert an affirmative defense um, if, if she or he was a victim of human trafficking so that they're not, uh, you know, in a, in a defense, an affirmative defense can be overcome by prosecution. But really the, the impetus or the thought behind this is that we absolutely shouldn't be criminalizing folks that are human trafficking victims. So this really essentially forces the courts to look at a prostitution charge and a prostitution case um, and look at that to see if there's an underlying factual basis of human trafficking and the idea is that uh, that sort of putting this within the court procedure uh, makes it easier or makes it um, more you know less likely that uh, human trafficking victims won't be charged with prostitution and won't be um, convicted of prostitution uh, so that is one large premise of the bill it also did some um, some cleanup work around uh, sealing and expungement of records because of course you know, folks can imagine if you're a human trafficking victim and you have a prostitution related, you know, conviction on your criminal record that can make it extremely hard to gain, um, gain different employment, even securing housing. Um, so this bill looks at different processes and, and there's a couple dates that you'll see um, on this slide, you know, on or after July 1st, 2016 and then before July 1st, 2015. So essentially this, there was some cleanup done to make sure that both adults and juveniles have the ability to either seal or expunge their records and then it can go um, both ahead, you know, uh, looking ahead as well as in the past for records that folks may have um, before 2015. So um, this is another bill that was signed into law on the 16th and it's, it's, it is effective now. Um, uh, and I just wanted to share, you know, this bill is another uh, effort really of constituent engagement and, and advocacy. So in this picture of standing behind the governor, the woman with the red shirt and kind of dark hair who's looking down, um, she is very active and uh, sex worker rights, sex worker policy, and advocacy. And this was really something that she's been working on for a couple years. So CICASA, we were excited to be able to support this effort. So moving along through the Senate bills, the next one I want to talk about is Senate Bill 77. This was a bill that CICASA opposed. Um, some folks may have heard about it. It got a lot of media attention. Um, it was a very polarizing piece of legislation. Of course, CICASA is a bipartisan organization and we work very well with um, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, but this was a bill that um, clearly came from one sort of wing of the party um, and it had a lot of concerns. So, you know, sort of on the surface, this idea, of course, parents should have rights over their kids. Um, 
But this bill essentially gave forth a lot of power that is not already uh, there and, and certainly isn't safe um, in situations that, that may involve family violence, child abuse, that sort of thing. So what the bill did is it said that parents have sort of total control of their kids' education and health care, um, including mental health care services. So this idea that, that um, a, a kid, a youth, a teen um, has to have parental consent and parental consent, per, parents can opt out of any sort of health care or education that they don't see fit. So you know, we really had to look at that bill in terms of the harmful imp implications for youth that are seeking sexual assault services. Um, and, and that's something I can talk more about um, what our statutes look like if it's if it's helpful for people. We also have our teen toolkit, which is available on our website that walks folks through some of the statutes related to teens obtaining uh, services. But we just think it's really important. We know that youth may come forward for sexual assault related care, whether it's advocacy services or healthcare services, and they, they may not feel safe telling a parent. Uh, so we know how time sensitive and how important that treatment could be and um, in creating a framework where uh, a teen has to go through their parents. Um, we don't believe that that best serves all, all youth in our state. So I will say um, this bill, so the term is postponed indefinitely. What that means is the bill died. <laughs> Um, so it was killed on March 17th and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we kind of continually see efforts like this, but, but we were pleased with this bill, with the outcome of this bill, um, because it was something that we thought would be really problematic for teens, um, and youth. So the next one I want to talk about is Senate Bill 109. Um, this is a bill that to be totally honest, um, it sort of came up quickly. I think that there had been uh, the Joint Budget Committee, um, different entities had been working on it for a while, but um, I feel like CCASA unfortunately was a little bit late to the game on this one. Um, the good news is that we have a fantastic uh, member agency, the Arc of Aurora, that was really involved with advocacy efforts on this. Um, they provide advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that's really what this bill was about. So as folks know, Colorado, we do have mandatory reporting obligations for minors, which we believe are, are, are important. Um, the, if adults know that a child is being harmed, then, then that information needs to be brought forward and, and handled appropriately. A couple of years ago, uh, Colorado also created a mandatory reporting obligation for elders. So under that law, elders um, applied to adults that are 70 years of age or older, but Colorado did not have a mandatory reporting requirement for adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. So, um, so service professionals or folks who are working with an individual from this community, you know, if they thought or knew or had reason to believe that an adult uh, with an intellectual or developmental disability was being abused or harmed, they weren't mandated by law to do anything with that information. And and that can be really problematic if you think about the very high rates of victimization amongst this population. Um, we know that sex offenders uh, seek out victims that are vulnerable, accessible, and, and, and lacking in credibility. And unfortunately, in our society, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, are vulnerable, and sex offenders use that to gain access. So because it is a high risk population for this victimization um, this you know certainly was a bill that we supported um, we didn't do the bulk of the work on it though um, so really our, our member program arc of aurora did a ton of work and, and we're really thankful for that um, so i think what i want folks to know about this bill is that the mandatory the list of mandatory reporters for minors um, and elders and now people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are different um, so for an example, a community-based victim advocate is a mandatory reporter for child abuse or suspected child abuse. A community-based victim advocate is not a mandated reporter for elder abuse. And as this bill is written, will not be a mandatory reporter for intellectual and developmental disabilities either. And the reason behind that, frankly, is that um, a lot of folks from the confidential community-based advocacy community felt that it was important um, we were looking at the elder abuse issue, you know, that a person over the age of 70 needs to be able to go somewhere and talk to somebody about what's going on. Um, and they may not feel safe or ready to engage with law enforcement. So with these bills, um, there is though a list of who is a mandated reporter, as you can imagine, medical professionals, 
are on it. Uh, social workers are on it. Law enforcement professionals are on it. So, so that's just one thing I want to mention that folks should take a list, uh, take a look at who are the mandatory reporters, and you have that citation um, on the screen. You can find it in um, Colorado, Colorado Revised Statutes 18-6.5-108, and I can also uh, send that to you if, if that's helpful. And that's the list that applies for elders and people with um, developmental and intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, I also wanted folks to see that the way this bill is structured, there will be an implementation task force to prepare recommendations uh, for how the state can adopt this approach, and that's certainly going to include training. Um, we know that anytime there's any you know new practice, uh, there's there's a large training curve. Um, so that's what this. So before it officially becomes law, um, this implementation task force um, will convene, and then the mandatory reporting obligation essentially uh, will start July 1st of 2016. So, and the elder abuse um, situation was like that too. There was sort of some time to work it out first, and then it became effective. That is effective now. So that's the approach for this bill as well. Um, and we are going to talk more about Senate Bill 128, which was CCOS's priority bill around reporting options. You know, one thing that that I'll mention is, you know, once um, Senate Bill 109 is signed into law, um, the reporting options uh, under Senate Bill 128 are, will not be eligible for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, nor are they eligible for, for people who fall under the at-risk elder statute, uh, because those statutes say, you know, if some if a mandated reporter knows or suspects abuse, then they need to um, share that person's it, it name and information essentially with law enforcement. So that's not possible with anonymity. So um, we'll talk much more about that um, in a moment. And then also in a subsequent webinar, we're doing just on Senate Bill 128. Okay, so uh, the next one I want to talk about, and hopefully you guys are staying with me and aren't completely bored, um, is Senate Bill 124. So this was a bill that um, came from the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition and was ha pretty heavily lobbied and supported by the Department of Corrections. So I don't want to get you know too in the weeds and the details on this one, but I will say that this was a bill that uh, folks within the victim services community had some concerns about. Um, CCASA had numerous stakeholder meetings with Department of Corrections and the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition about this bill. So essentially what this bill addressed is what happens when somebody is out on parole. When somebody is paroled, they uh, they still have a list of sort of requirements, things that they have to do, uh, sort of directives to stay out of trouble and make sure that they don't reoffend. Um, so when that's called, those are called. Um, if somebody breaks those rules, essentially, that's a technical violation. So it can be anything from, you know, somebody who's on parole that's not supposed to drink or use drugs. Um, they're not going to their uh, treatment therapy appointments, um, they have curfew that they're violating, those sort of things. So um, what can happen when, when an offender or somebody who's on parole uh, commits technical violations, they can be sent back to the Department of Corrections. Um, with, essentially, that's called a parole revocation when they're sent back. Um, so this bill, frankly, is an attempt to lower, to lessen the number of um, folks that are being sent back to D.C. because of uh, a technical violation. So I think when we first looked at this bill, what we were really interested in is how does this apply to sex offenders? Because um, we know that sex offenders can pose a, a large threat to public safety. And we just wanted to make sure that if and when a sex offender is you know, breaking the rules and doing something they're not supposed to do because their parole officer you know, has looked at their risk and they have um, these sort of rules in place to help mitigate their risk, risk um, we just wanted to make sure that, uh, that there was a real consistent thought around when they were sent back to DOC or not. So, you know, the example that immediately popped into people's heads was, okay, so you have somebody that is on parole for a sex offense and a part of their terms of parole are that uh, they can't see children. They can't be around, ch around children. So you have somebody who violates that and is around children. You know, now are we saying they can't be sent back to prison? Um, because that's, that's problematic. So 
we sort of started really investigating this one and trying to get a sense of of what all it did and what all it said. Um, it, it was this bill came from a Department of Corrections pilot program, and and I'll tell you all that pilot was not completed yet, so it's a little bit hard to look at outcome data from a pilot that's not done yet. There hasn't been a published study. There hasn't. There's not even a report we can look at. Um, but who was eligible for the pilot program was outlined in some administrative rules, and those administrative rules we were able to take a look at. And um, sex offenders were largely excluded from it, meaning that if a sex offender violated their terms of parole, then they were able to be sent back to DOC. The only type of technical violation that a sex offender um, that a sex offender was eligible for this program um, was something like, you know, if they missed an appointment, then instead of being sent back to DOC, um, the parole officer could use these sanctions, swift, certain, consistent, proportional sanctions, but not sending them back. Um, so that in some ways made us feel better that, you know, the example that I gave about an offender who uh, interfaces with children when they're not allowed to, that, that would not be eligible for this program anyway. Um, so we, we felt better when we saw the administrative rules and felt like um, they adhered a little bit more to public safety issues around offenders. Um, as you can see, the CCASA position was active amend. Um, so there were a few changes that we were able to make with this bill. Um, but to kind of tighten up some of the public safety concerns on it. Um, but this is something that I think, honestly, we're just going to have to keep an eye on because, you know, there's certainly examples where somebody violates the parole where maybe it does make sense for them to, um, you know, have to write an essay about it where they, then that's, that's an example of a, of one of these proportional sanctions or where somebody um, has to submit to, you know, drug and alcohol testing that hadn't before, or somebody now has a different curfew, or even somebody does sh is um, is now given like a short stint in jail. Um, so some of those things may make sense, but with the sex offender population, there also may be situations where it is appropriate to send them back to Department of Corrections due to public safety risks. So we just um, really need to keep sort of an eye on this and, and see how it is interfacing with uh, community safety issues. Um, so Senate Bill 128, so we wanted to get to that one. That was, um, folks who have seen a lot about it, you know, I consider it really CCASA's priority bill. Um, this is a bill that our agency has been working on for a few years and in collaboration with other stakeholders as well, um, certainly folks across the state, really taking a look at what, um, what we call Colorado's medical mandated reporting statute. So this is a statute that applies to competent adults that are seeking health care. Um, so the statute is uh, 1236-135 is the citation. And prior to Senate Bill 128, you know, I would say that I thought this statute was a, a bit of a mess and really unclear as uh, it applied to sexual assault. There were a lot of questions about who is this, who does, who is the statute even relevant for, like what medical professionals are mandated to make a report to law enforcement. Um, a lot of nurses were interpreting it and, apply, and applying it to their practice. Uh, there were other folks who who sort of looked at the statute more closely and said, no, the statute only applies to physicians, physicians assistants, and anesthesiologist assistants. So there's uh, some question about who is even covered under the statute, and then what are they required to report? So the way the statute was worded was essentially that if a medical professional, um, and again, that was up for debate who, who it applied to, if a medical professional, though, um, was treating injuries that they believed to have been caused by a crime, then they needed to notify law enforcement. So I think from the community-based advocacy perspective, you know, our concern was essentially um, just recognizing that a lot of folks may not feel safe or ready or able to talk to law enforcement, but they need and want health care. So if somebody is going to the hospital, you know, because they're, they need treatment for injuries, um, what does this look like, you know, in terms of law enforcement being contacted? Um, and then also, you know, it sort of does put the medical professional in a bit of a different role. You know, the medical professional is there to do just that, to treat injuries and assess um, injuries in patient care. 
they're not an investigator. So this whole, you know, if the medical professional professional believes the injuries are caused by a crime um, can be a little bit problematic too, um, because is that really the role of the medical professional to determine whether or not an injury was caused by a crime? Um, so we had done some research over the years and really surveying folks about the statute and asked folks around the state, you know, how are you interpreting this um, in terms of sex assault? Is this affecting sex assault patient care? And we got a lot of data, uh, but really what it showed us was that nobody was really interpreting the statute the same. And there were a lot of questions and a lot of confusion around it. And yes, it did result in patient care issues where patients, um, you know, weren't getting health care or were afraid to get health care for a sex assault because um, they they weren't sure if they were going to have to talk to law enforcement before they were ready. Um, and they weren't sure what that conversation and, and interfacing with law enforcement would look like. We found that it disproportionately affected um, certain vulnerable communities. So if, a, if somebody, for example, was undocumented, um, having to talk to law enforcement to get health care um, really brought out a lot of concerns for folks. There were maybe concerns that um, this would all result in them being deported. Uh, people who were using um, drugs at the time of the assault, maybe someone that was in 19, 20, you know, underage drinking, um, having to talk to law enforcement before they're ready. Um, so we, we did feel like it was pretty important to take a look at the statute and try and clarify it specifically for sex assault. So I will say, you know, this statute, um, we kind of started with a little bit of a mess, I would think. So I do think that Senate Bill 128 um, made it much more clear in terms of sex assault. Um, but there may still be ongoing questions, and that's why we are going to do a webinar just on this bill. So I won't spend a ton much more time on it, but just wanting to let folks know that now if a sex assault patient that is not covered under the mandatory reporting statutes for you know children, at-risk adults, uh, you know elders, people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So essentially folks between the ages of 18 and 69 that don't meet um, those other categories. Um, if they want evidence collected, they want a medical forensic exam, that evidence has to be stored by law enforcement. Um, so there's some sort of interfacing with law enforcement. Um, so in those cases, uh, the victim has the choice. They can work with law enforcement. They can be a medical report where that means they're just uh, they're disclosing the sex assault to the medical provider and evidence is being stored under their name. Um, so they have the option um, to have that evidence tested or they can be an anonymous reporting victim where they the evidence is just stored by a unique uh, tracking number um, that an anonymous reporting victim um, doesn't. They're not mandated to speak to law enforcement unless they want to. So essentially that person is a Jane Doe or a John Doe or, you know, however they want to self-define. But, but law enforcement is not given their uh, contact information. Um, so that's those are the three options for somebody that is having evidence collected. Um, but then the legislation now clarifies that if there's no evidence collected, so a patient is just getting sex assault care, you know, they just um, want to talk to somebody about an S they are afraid they may have contracted an STI for an example. Um, the bill, the legislation says that um, certainly law enforcement could be contacted, but it's not mandated by the medical professional. That it's um, that that essentially should be up to an adult victim's choice um, when to involve law enforcement. So. Um, that bill, again, we had some amazing survivor testimony. We had amazing um, activism from uh, the CICASA community, and it was signed into law. I believe it was unanimous at the legislature. Uh, we also did end up um, receiving, the bill was endorsed or supported by the Police Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, um, sex assault nurse examiners from around the state, um, the Nurses Association. So it did have wide support, and, and we're really I'm excited about it. But, you know, as folks know that anytime you do a substantial law change where it changes practice for both law enforcement and medical professionals and advocacy for that matter, it can take time um, to implement and make sure it's, it's being implemented as intended. Um, so we are doing a webinar training on May 20th. We also have one scheduled again in June, just talking about Senate Bill 128. And, and I'd like to encourage folks to 
to sign up for that webinar, but also to spend some time um, at ccasa.org backslash reporting options. So at that URL, uh, that is where you can sign up for the webinar. There's also extensive tools for service providers on Senate Bill 128 implementation. So as you can imagine, there's you know new forms that need to go in rape kits. Um, there's a new evidence collection protocol uh, that includes some specific information about how law enforcement should store anonymous kits. So there's a lot of great information there, and there's definitely more to come. So I am so sorry. I'm talking so fast and going so quickly, but I, really the purpose of this webinar is just to give folks um, you know, just a brief overview, and then as Rosa said, you'll get the, the PowerPoint and some other supplemental resources for this webinar. So thanks for bearing with me talking really fast. Um, so the next one I want to talk about is Senate Bill 129. So this was a bill that CCASA did oppose, um, and it's you know a little bit of complex legislation to explain quickly, but but the gist of it was that this bill uh, created some pretty sweeping change would have created some pretty sweeping changes to um, what happens um, around allocation of parental responsibilities, or uh, that's what it's called in Colorado, but folks think about it as child custody. Um, so in, in divorce cases or dissolution of marriage or just cases where folks are splitting up um, and there's children involved. So right now that parental allocation of determining allocation of parental responsibilities is really based on the best interest of the child statute. So it's not, you know, that one parent gets a certain amount of time and the other parent gets a certain percentage. It's based on what's best for the kids. Um, and we think that's really important um, that that does, that that's sort of our framework for making decisions um, about who the child resides with and who has decision making. Um, this bill would have made a pretty sweeping change to that with by essentially um, creating a presumption that there should be substantially equal parenting time. Um, so meaning, you know, substantially equal, that makes you think 50-50, that kids should have this 50-50 arrangement. Um, and that really raised a lot of concerns, especially in homes where there may be domestic violence, um, you know, a, a child that was conceived by rape, um, child abuse reports. And even beyond that, at the hearing, you know, folks just testified you know, experts really around child development talked about how, you know, 50-50 models just aren't good for every kid. For some kid that some kids that can be really stressful to have to go back and forth, back and forth. You know, some kids really need stability, especially little kids, you know, before the age of three. Um, lots of factors around what's best for children, um, where we know this model of substantially equal parenting time isn't best for every kid and every family. And and it really scared folks to think that the legislature would have this um, this sort of cookie cutter approach to situations that are much more complex. So um, I will say that you know our our allies at the Colorado Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the Family Law Section of the Bar Association, um, a couple of our victim law centers and the, and survivors uh, did an incredible job with this bill. It was killed. Um, the hearing went until I believe. 1 a.m., um, if not later. I left at 11 p.m. because that was just all I could do, but it was one of the more powerful hearings that I've ever been to. Um, and really, you know, survivors just spoke about um, how important it was for the safety of their children um, that the allocation of parental responsibilities stayed based on the best interest of the child statute. So very thankful to say that this bill was killed and very thankful to our allies who did a lot of hard work on this one. Okay, so I'm done with the Senate bills. Um, now I'm going to talk about the House bills. Um, so House Bill 1035, this um, is a pretty, there were a lot of updates really to um, sort of clean up and update our uh, victim compensation laws and statutes. So I am going to send out a fact sheet. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this one. So you all will get a copy of the fact sheet with the PowerPoint. Um, so definitely take a look at it. You know, CCASA did testify um, in support of this bill. Um, I specifically at the hearing talked about the importance of confidentiality, keeping victim compensation records confidential, because there have been situations in which um, the defense tried to access those records, um, maybe to get more information on um, the victim's uh, mental health care, that sort of thing. So the so the importance of confidentiality of those records. Um, another piece of this bill that I really liked was um, a provision to make sure that um, 
the a debt collector isn't contacting and harassing a victim um, when there's a pending victim compensation claim. So as you can imagine, you know, victim compensation may be paying for hospital bills related to a sex assault, but that takes time for that paperwork to go through. Um, and in the meantime, victims have been turned over to collections, which can be extremely uh, stressful for victims. So there was a provision that um, the folks who crafted this bill worked with some of those debt collection agencies to set some parameters around that, which I thought um, was really great. Um, there's also a piece expanding uh, ac expanding eligibility for victim compensation that I think has a kind of a unique intersection for um, sex assault and domestic violence cases. So uh, this bill expanded the definition of dependent. So that so say a situation where um, so we'll say you know there's a couple and um, husband, wife, two kids, just, just to make it easy, um, to, to illustrate it. And let's say the, the husband or the dad, um, was arrested for, um, for sex assault, you know, maybe somebody not in the family, but somebody in the community. So, um, the opening up expansion made it so, you know, we've heard situations in which now mom can't pay the mortgage because it can't pay the bills because, you know, the uh, dad is the primary breadwinner and he is now um, a defendant in a criminal case. So this makes it so that um, the family member of the offender can be eligible for victim compensation if, as a result of the criminal event, the offender vacated the, the shared residence. Um, and now, you know, there's there's um, household support that's been lost. Um we certainly wouldn't want um, the family to be um, homeless as a result of, of the crime that was committed. So, um, so eligibility was expand, expanded in that way. Um, this bill also increased the maximum amount um, for victim compensation and it eliminated the floor for compensation claims. So, um, so we will send out the fact sheet and definitely take a look at that further. Um, just want to keep going through different bills. So House Bill 1060 is a bill around protection orders um, in sex offense cases. So as, as folks may know, current law requires the court um, state the terms of a, of a criminal protection order that the defendant has to acknowledge um, before they can be bonded out. Um, so that's in place for domestic violence and stalking. So this bill just aligned it so that um, sex, it's the same situation with sex offenders as well. And that they have to acknowledge that criminal protection protection order before um, before being able to be bonded out. So this is for cases specifically in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, so CCASA did not um, engage heavily with this bill. You know, we certainly would have and supported it, but frankly, um, it, it didn't seem, it seemed like it went pretty easily and there weren't a lot of challenges with it. And the District Attorney's Council did a lot of work on, on this bill as well. Um, so House Bill 1072 was a bill that came out of a uh, legislative task force in 20 um, that met during the interim and a 2014 bill that actually failed. Um, but it was looking at this issue of cyberbullying, which is a topic we continue to hear about. Um, so what this this bill actually did was just make sure that electronic devices are covered under our harassment statute. Okay, so House Bill 1174 um, was around um, the address confidentiality program and extending some of the protections under it. So if folks are not aware of the address confidentiality program, you know, it's something that uh, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking are all eligible for. And we certainly um, hope that it's used in a wide variety of safety planning with victims and survivors. Um, it's a way that if a victim has recently moved, um, then that new address can be kept confidential confidential and out of sort of public databases. So this bill um, was actually the, the impetus for were real property records. So situations in which somebody um, owns their house, um, a lot of times the county clerk and recorder and tax assessors, that information um, is posted online. So an offender could find the location of the victim by um, searching those county clerk and recorder and tax assessor um, databases and records. And we know that offenders will go to great lengths like that. Um, so this bill makes it so that those real property records, you know, the property information may still be up, but it removes the name if the property holder is in the address confidentiality program. So it's just sort of one more way um, to make sure that the actual address of victims who are in that program, um, one more way to 
to keep it from being online. And as folks know, it can be really hard to control what's on the internet. Um, but we thought this was, again, another step in the right direction. So CCASA did actively support this bill and um, worked with a survivor who, who's in the program who testified as to the program's importance. Um, so we were very excited to see this bill um, signed into law. Okay, so moving on. Um, so House Bill 1220 was a bill um, around Colorado um, higher education in response to sexual assault. So just really quickly, a brief background on the bill. Um, Representative Danielson, who um, is the woman in the, the green blouse, um, kind of in the center of that picture, a new representative approached CICASA um, when a media piece ran, I believe over the summer, um, it was a PBS state of mind piece and it looked at how far college students have to travel to get a medical forensic exam following a sexual assault. Um, so after seeing that media piece, she really wanted to work on this issue. Um, so we worked with her to figure out, you know, what, what, could, what made sense, what was politically viable, what was something we could do. Um, there were some initial interest from legislators and like mandating every college to perform uh, medical forensic exams. And that was just uh, not something that, that we thought was feasible or something that would be a good idea. So this bill was sort of what we, um, what we settled on in a way, but I, I actually think it's a great piece of legislation and I hope it makes a big um, difference for college survivors. Um, so essentially what this bill does is it mandates that college campuses have a memorandum of understanding or like a partnership and an agreement with a medical forensic exam program for the purposes of effectively referring students. Um, so that if a student on campus, you know, seeks to obtain sexual assault related medical care, uh, the school knows where to best refer them to for that care. Um, you know, this issue looks really different depending on if you're in rural Colorado um, or metro areas, but at the end of the day, we know that not every hospital or clinic has that specialized training. And we do think it behooves students to go to be referred to a program that does have some of that specialized care and training up front instead of having to try numerous hospitals, um, traveling long distances, going to places and maybe get some getting sent somewhere else that can be really difficult for victims. It can also be costly. Um, the bill also requires that campus health center staff, uh, you know, it logically makes sense that students may disclose sex assault to camp their campus health center um, medical professionals. So the bill requires that campus health center staff have to have um, some sex assault specific training every two years. So the bill is um, fairly you know, open. It doesn't say if that training needs to be um, web-based, if it's in person. Um, but it, the, the bill does say that that training needs to be done by a SANE and an advocate. An um, advocate can be a, a campus advocate, a community-based advocate, or a law enforcement advocate. Um, so those two entities need to co-train. Um, the, the training should cover a few core areas. So those areas are um, just kind of an overview of medical forensic exams for the purposes of answering uh, students' questions about it, um, long and short-term health impacts of sexual assaults, uh, victim dynamics, trauma response, uh, different payment programs like the Sex Assault Victim Emergency Payment Program, victim compensation, um, as well as you know an overview of reporting options. Just so um, that if and when a student comes into their campus health center, that campus health center staff is trained to give an appropriate referral, but also answer basic questions. So um, this bill was signed into law. Um, as folks know, CICASA does do an annual campus training every year in July. Um, registration is currently open for that, and we are going to be um, talking kind of specifically about House Bill 1220 at that training um, and working with um, some folks to help provide sort of a model sample training so that folks can take that back to their community. Um, so House Bill 1273 is a bill that, frankly, CICASA has been working on since 2011, off and on. Um, and this, this effort came from this desire to really have a sense of what's going on in our schools. Um, and when are kids being referred to law enforcement? You know, certainly there's situations in which it's appropriate for a school or a student to uh, be referred to law enforcement. Um, but there also are situations in which there's a lot of concern about, you know, a school to jail pipeline that kids from some communities and kids from marginalized communities where they may be experiencing racism and classism are disproportionately referred to law enforcement. Um, 
instead of, you know, behavioral issues that could have been handled within the school, um, that they're being disproportionately referred to, referred to law enforcement. So there's been a real interest in trying to get a sense, a, a grasp on this issue. Um, you know, what crimes are happening in schools and then how are they handled? Um, you know, who is being arrested from schools? What cases are being filed on by the DA when we're talking about minors? Um, so when this, this bill came up in 2012, uh, there was a lot of interest in getting this data, but, you know, research doesn't write itself and data doesn't collect itself. So back in 2012, um, folks asked for 2.5 essentially employees, like two and a half people to collect data from schools, law enforcement, and DA's offices to analyze that data on school-based arrests, prosecutions, referrals, and then to uh, issue a report on it. Well, in 2012, nobody funded it. <laughs> so between now and then, um, that data has not been collected in a uniform manner. Um, and, and this bill, House Bill 1273, was an attempt to try again, you know, that if we really want to get a sense of um, school-based crime and, and what's happening with it, then then we need to look at this issue again and we need to fund it. See, CASA's interest in the bill has, was a little bit more narrow and um, certainly we support everything I just said. Um, but one thing that was pretty interesting through this process is that K through 12 schools have a safe school reporting requirement where they have to collect data on this variety, this list of school-based offenses. So everything from tobacco infractions, you know, bringing cigarettes to school, to bringing a deadly weapon to school, you know, physical assault, destruction of school property, uh, really anything you can think of, you know, school districts are supposed to be compiling that information and putting it out annually in a safe school report. Well, you have this long list of school-based crimes and school-based discipline um, code violations, and what was missing from that list was sexual violence. Um, you kind of have, schools have to report on everything else that they, they weren't required to report on prevalence of um, sex assault in their schools. So um, we worked on, you know, trying to get that specific data collection requirement in place for schools. Um, I, I gotta say, I'm kind of shocked uh, at this point. Um, this bill is not, it should be done today. Um, the funding part that I talked about, it looks like there was funding for one position to do some of this data connection, data collection and analysis. And it looks like, um, this requirement for schools to collect data on sex assault um, is a part of the bill. So that's something that I think is really important for our community-based advocates as well as system-based advocates to know about, um, that, that we as a state need to be keeping an eye on these safe school reporting requirements and seeing what schools are reporting in terms of when they become aware of prevalence of sex assault uh, within schools. So more to come on that one, but um, but it's definitely a step forward in terms of transparency of, of how we're seeing sex assault in schools. Um, another bill um, that involved campus sex assault, again, this is higher education. I kind of jumped around, sorry, did one higher education, one K through 12, and now another higher education bill. Um, this was a bill that Representative Rhonda Fields brought forward. Um, and we only have about five minutes, so I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because the bill actually died. Um, it was it was postponed definitely by the sponsor, which means she pulled it herself. But um, there's just a lot of interest in figuring out how schools, how higher ed is handling sex assault. Um, this bill would have created a campus sex assault task force. And we had some concerns about who was appointed on the task force um, and just the whole scope of what it was going to be doing. And so anyway, this bill did not move forward, which as it was introduced, I think that that's OK. And um, there was some talk from um, different higher education lobbyists, um, CU in particular, about there being a statewide um, sex assault symposium. So I don't think that's anything that anybody has committed to, but it is something uh, maybe to keep an eye out for, especially if you work closely with the, your campus or on campus. You can definitely contact me for more questions. Um, so the last bill that I'm going to talk about um, it's House Bill 1328. I will say that um, this bill died, um, which was unfortunate. Um, so I could definitely, I'm happy to talk more about what happened with this one. And this is one that we'll be addressing and talking about at our public policy committee uh, because there's interest in bringing it back next year and trying to, again to get it through. Um, so this is a bill that mandated that coaches or volunteers for youth sports organizations have to complete a background check uh, prior to coaching or volunteering. And then if the applicant has a felony sex offense on their record, then they cannot coach. Um, so that seems like a no-brainer. It was actually incredibly controversial. Um, 
So I'm happy to, as, as I said, we'll be talking more about that one with our public policy committee. And if we had more time, I would go into why it died. Um, but uh, it was kind of, it was pretty disappointing because I think that everyone um, kind of agrees that you, nobody wants a felony sex offender coaching their children. Um, but the legislature really couldn't get to the place where they wanted to uh, mandate some background checks. Um, so we're about out of time, but... Um, as I said when I started, this was a really quick just snapshot of the session. Um, there's a lot of other bills that were on our radar, so I listed some up that may be of interest. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into them, but if the, any of these sort of titles trigger uh, your interest or thoughts, feel free to send me an email or um, feel free to do uh, to try uh, doing some research and see what you can come up with by going to that ledge.state.co.us website where you can read any of these bills in entirety. So before we wrap up, I just want to close with a poll, a last poll, just asking folks um, if you did take action on legislation this session. Um, so you'll see uh, there's a couple different options. You know, did you call, email your legislators regarding a bill? Um, did anybody testify at a um, at a bill hearing? Nobody has voted. Okay, now a few people have started. Uh, did you share an urgent um policy action alert? Uh, did you watch our YouTube policy podcast? Or uh, maybe you didn't take any action. So yay, it looks like the uh, of you, those of you who voted, 80% of you called or emailed your legislators um, at this point. Oh, now it's changing. The numbers are shifting rapidly. <laughs> so go ahead and vote. Um, but it looks like a lot of you did. You called and emailed your legislators. You um, shared urgent policy action alerts. We can go ahead and um, close it if you want, because I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, so as you guys see, um, folks did take action. There were there was almost a quarter of you though who didn't take action on anything. Um, and I hope that you know these are you guys. You're spending an hour of your time looking at legislation and what happened this session. And um, I really do want to encourage you all to please. Um, to like us on social media, to keep an eye out on the public policy section of our website, and to please, um, and, and to really um, think about getting involved in our public policy committee. Um, there's absolutely room and place for all of you and for your impact and feedback. So I really ask you to, to think about how you can engage in this work. Um, even though the session just ends today, we are going to start planning for 2016 and beyond right away. So uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments about moving forward. So thanks again for spending your afternoon with us. And please feel free to send me an email for any questions. I know this went quick. Thanks again. Take care. Hi, everybody. This is Rosa. Thank you, Karen, for all of that information. Very helpful. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email with the handouts that Karen talked about, as well as a copy of her presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email Karen, or you can also email myself. Um, please do fill out the survey at the end. Your feedback is very important to us. Um, thanks, everybody, and have a great day.